Okay, good morning. Um, my name is Chris Hardesty. I'm one of the pediatric orthopedic surgeons here at Rainbow, uh, and I do go to Metro as well. Um, and the majority of my uh, patient population either has severe scoliosis or cerebral palsy, although we also see all the other neuromuscular disorders. Um, and in my second fellowship, I spent a lot of time with a gentleman named Freeman Miller at uh, DuPont. Um, who really taught me how to look at the management of spasticity very differently than the typical orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and so this is going to be as fast as I can go to catch up on time. Um, and I do consult for a couple of companies, one of whom's products I'm going to mention, uh, but I will try to stay off label. I mean, on label, on label and off brand name. Um, so I think what I want to try and do is turn around the way we look at patients and not look at them clinically, but think about how they're looking at their own bodies and how they're looking at their own care. Um, and so for a lot of the kids we see, and a lot of people who have spasticity, uh, they're just trying to live their life as best they can. And we're looking at them often thinking, how can I treat you? How can I treat you? How can I treat you? Uh, but we really need to look at what the person needs. So when I see them, the first thing I do is try to listen to as much as they have to tell me to try and understand what their actual needs are. Um, and then again, orthopedists look at them and they see, okay, what joint is contracted? What thing needs surgery? What hip is dislocated? But really the tone is the underlying problem. So the first thing I'm thinking of is how can I get your tone under control? Don't compromise your strength. And can I treat your contractures? or other problems after we've gotten your tone under control and kept you as strong as you can be. And this is an old um, way of explaining tone that you've probably seen before, you know, input versus output, um, excitation versus inhibition. But when I'm talking to families, I tell them that tone is like a light switch. And for you or I, we have a biceps tone that's either off or on, off or on. It's a flip switch. And your patient with spasticity has a dimmer switch and it's always on and it can be turned up and they can be really tight or it can be turned down and they can be looser. And so my job as somebody managing your spasticity is how do I turn down the dimmer switch without making you weak? So why does spasticity matter to the orthopedist? Well, spasticity is an underlying tone problem, but it also creates all these orthopedic problems. So scoliosis often comes from spasticity, joint contractures, um, all the things we end up treating surgically, foot problems, knee problems, uh, the scissoring of legs that eventually not only disrupts walking, but causes hip dislocations. Uh, and then all the problems that come along with upper extremity function when it's abnormal inability to participate in ADLs, inability to be mobile either because you can't hold on to crutches, you can't walk independently, or you can't push a wheelchair, or you can't use your hand enough to drive a power chair. A lot of times the things we've done for tone management are just giving somebody back the ability to move the joystick for their power chair. Treating severe spasticity can improve everything about daily life, hygiene, activities of daily living. A lot of these people are dependent on caregivers. So if it makes the burden of care easier on the caregiver, that's helpful. If it takes you an hour to get your kid dressed, that's probably a little unrealistic, but you know, you're 20 minutes of sweating and fighting arms to get a shirt on versus looser arms. I literally have a parent who said we used to fight for a good 10 minutes per foot to get his shoes on. We were both sweating at the end. And after a device I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, they have no problems getting their shoes on anymore. It's easy every day. Um, can we decrease your spasms and the underlying pain that comes from spasticity, which I think a lot of people don't acknowledge or understand if they don't experience muscle spasms every day. But if you get a Charlie horse, that hurts, right? You get a cramp in your calf. Imagine living with that all day, every day, constant tone, the buildup of lactic acid. Um, and then can we improve the range of motion and joint positioning? Can we make it easier for you to stand or sit? Can we make you more mobile? This kid right here, his name's Christopher. Uh, he had pretty severe, um, tone in his legs and knee contractures, and he was really unable to do a lot of walking. And after we started Baclofen and did very small hamstring lengthenings, he's up and moving around with a walker. So he was able to participate in sports. Here he is doing a play, uh, that he couldn't do before. And the spasticity is generally undertreated. So primary care physicians don't want to touch this, 
Um, and they often aren't aware enough that there are ways that it can be treated that they need to refer. Um, they're getting better, especially in this area, but, uh, that it's undertreated in lots of places because of that reason. And then a lot of surgeons or neurologists don't feel comfortable addressing it either. So there's lots of ways to treat spasticity. There's a whole laundry list, and I'm going to break them up for you into categories based on is the spasticity you can't see it at the top of this slide, but that would be general. Is it general? Does it involve your whole body or is it focal? Does it involve just one extremity or two extremities? Uh, is it reverse? Do you want to treat it in a reversible way or do you want to treat it in a permanent way? And when you really start to separate these into categories, it just tells you exactly what, well, not hundred percent, but you get a better idea of what treatment you want to do. So if we want to do something that's both general and reversible, we can use oral meds. We can use PT or speech. I'm not speech therapy, PT or OT. Um, so common oral meds are GABA receptors, right? The problem with a lot of people who have spasticity, uh, at least of cerebral or spinal cord origin is that the GABA receptors aren't being stimulated appropriately. And so if we can give them a GABA agonist, like baclofen, most commonly used one, um, that's helpful. It does work in the CSF. So if you take it orally, it has to cross your blood brain barrier and baclofen is a big molecule when taken orally, it has a hard time making it across the blood brain barrier. So you have to take a lot of it in order to get, um, the amount you actually need. And then it works everywhere pretty diffusely. It, it doesn't target any specific spot. Um, but one of the good things about baclofen is it's hard to build up a tolerance. So like if I put a kid on 10 milligrams and they're fully grown, likely they'll be able to stay on that dose without needing increases over time, which is not true of some of the other medications. Um, diazepam and dantrolene are both commonly used as well, although not as common as baclofen. And there's a ton of other things which are not really relevant for this talk. Injection therapy is also reversible, but focal. So now if you need to pick out a specific body part to treat rather than the whole body, um, you might be able to use Botox for that or, uh, alcohol or phenol injections. There's other things besides Botox, Dysport, Myoblock. Um, but we primarily use Botox, uh, for lots of reasons. Um, it is a anticholinergic, no, it's an acetylcholine uptake inhibitor. Um, and it is finite in its lifetime. So, uh, the, the neuromuscular junction will produce acetylcholine again and overcome the Botox that you gave the patient. Um, it works anywhere from three to 12 months. So if you're using it for something long-term, it may have to be repeated. Um, I'll show you on the next slide reasons why you might not do that. Uh, and it works in an area that's also somewhat focal. So you need to target your injection near the neuromuscular junction. Um, <laughs> It's gaining in popularity for lots of other reasons, which is kind of interesting. I did not realize that they had a campaign targeting men, but I thought that was kind of funny. Anyway, uh, one of the problems with Botox though, is that it, it gained popularity so quickly for spasticity that it got used really diffusely in high doses, very frequently repeated. And, um, we're not sure if that's the right thing to do. Should we be using Botox as much as we do, as frequently as we do in doses that we're using it? Ways it can be helpful, especially if you're going through a growth spurt. It's a great way to keep a body part stretched out. Um, it can help prevent contractures. Uh, it definitely, I have a number of kids who walk better when they're getting Botox. Um, and that's just a slide of how it works. But you, as we said before, have to hit the neuromuscular junctions and they're not in one single spot in a muscle. So you have to kind of spread them out, but you need to be in the target in the muscle. Um, so you wouldn't certainly want to put it you know, somewhere down here. Um, this is a picture of a man named Kerr Graham, who's a pediatric orthopedist in um, Australia and probably has done the most work in studying what we maybe shouldn't be doing with Botox. Um, he notes that improvement in gait is not always achieved. So especially if you're not getting benefit out of it, you should probably not use it for that purpose. Uh, and he feels that the, the benefits are probably shorter than people have published about in the past because some of the previous studies were flawed. They had adjacent interventions happening at the same time. Um, they used, uh, injection cycles that were not, uh, appropriate for the study design. Um, and then 
Uh, most outcomes looked at changes in muscle tone, but not necessarily improvement in function. When they published the study, it's really hard to comment on function, right? It's hard to study that. Um, and uh, changes in activity or participation. So another functional outcome have not necessarily been reported. Uh, if they look at animal studies, primarily, um, there's some muscle atrophy that occurs with Botox uh, and some loss of contractile elements. Um, I think this is an interesting slide looking at what happens to mouse muscle tissue after a year of Botox, um, obviously at a higher dose than we would usually give a human, but, uh, there is definitely clearly some changes in atrophy and you're thinking, huh, well, that's in a mouse. What about a human? And there's one, uh, I'm going to call him crazy man. Who's a marathon runner who agreed to let somebody inject Botox in his calf and then have muscle biopsies. That would not have been my choice, but this guy did it. So here's his right and left comparison. Uh, the right side was injected. The left was not. These are the MRIs. I'll show you the muscle on the next slide, but he clearly had some changes in his gastroc on the side that was injected compared to the side that was not over a course, the course of a year. And here's the muscle biopsy. So healthy side over there, nice big cells look great, but you see atrophy in the ones that were injected. So I think we still use Botox a lot, but we really need to think carefully about what we're using it for and um, what the purpose is and if we're actually getting benefit out of it. All right. Uh, what about orthopedic surgery for treatment of tone. Well, there's contractures. Uh, there are bony problems that develop because of that. And the tone's there, but there are still ways where our surgeries can help. Um, so common ones uh, may be derotational osteotomies to improve just the direction that the muscle is headed. Uh, certainly if you have an internally rotated hip, you're gonna have a hard time actually activating the muscles the way the lever arms are supposed to work. Um, guided growth is really useful. We do a lot of extension osteotomies around the knee for the distal femur. So this is one of the videos that we're going to show. So this is a little guy. Uh, you can see he's clearly internally rotated on his left. He's up on his toes. His knees are bent. Uh, and he'd never been on any spasticity medication or had treatment for that beforehand. I started him on some baclofen. So got his tone under some control. Uh, but he still needed to have that leg turned and have his knees and his ankles addressed. Oops. Uh, here he is uh, after surgery to correct the rotation and the, uh, you can see he's real slow at first and he needs um, some support still, but he's doing better. Uh, we needed to get the tone under a little bit better control. And so whoop, I keep trying to advance that. There we go. Um, about a year afterward, he came into clinic and the grin on this kid's face says it all, but basically he was elated because he didn't need a device and he didn't have to hold anybody's hand. Uh, and so here he goes, it's not fast, but it got the job done. He's walking with his feet flat. His knees are a little straighter. He needs probably a different AFO than he's wearing right there. Uh, and he just looks massively better. Um, okay. Uh, another option in this, uh, diagram for very generalized, although it can be lower extremity only, um, tone management is using intrathecal baclofen, um, which can be uh, used in lots of different ways. But I think the biggest reason to use it is if you need, um, either more than you're getting out of oral baclofen, or you want to target the lower extremity without getting the trunk effects and the floppy neck, um, because this is baclofen that's already crossed the blood brain barrier. It's given in the intrathecal space and it's delivered out of a catheter and you can control where that catheter tip goes. You can put it up high. You can put it up in the upper thoracic or the cervical spine and get a lot of body effects, or you can keep it down low where the, um, lumbar nerve roots are and try and hit the legs primarily. The distribution out of the catheter tip is about a three centimeter bell curve. And so you get a lot of effects near the catheter tip and less away from it. Um, here are 
videos of a patient we see, uh, who this is a trial. So this is her before I give her an interthecal baclofen trial. You can see she's really stiff and it's hard to move her. The lower video is an attempt to abduct her leg and she can't get past 10 degrees of abduction. She is just tight everywhere. And then, uh, post this is four hours after a single dose of intrathecal baclofen. She moves easily. She had no movement in her ankle before. It was like grade three on the modified Ashworth scale. She was tight, tight, tight. And now it's super easy to move her knee and her ankle actually has motion. It didn't have before. And she ended up getting a pump. Um, and this is her walking later. She couldn't walk without like maximal assistance, two person, lots of support. Her legs didn't move well. Uh, and now she's able to do it pretty independently with a walker around her house. She can actually walk with nothing. Um, if you're not familiar with pumps, this is the process of inserting the catheter and then uh, implanting the pump. The catheter gets passed from the back to the front. The pump gets implanted. So um, just to summarize quickly, I think as an orthopedic surgeon, again, we look at spasticity and we go, I can't just fix that with surgery really easily, but it's not a huge, scary thing. If you just break it into, am I treating the whole person? Am I treating body parts? Which body parts am I treating? Should I start with oral meds? Uh, can injectables help me? There's lots of options to help these people. Um, and no matter what you do, the tone has to be treated first. If you don't treat the tone, no matter what you do with surgery, the tone's going to come back and the problem will come back. Uh, and just be careful not to make them too weak. I think if you're not going to be <laughs> a neuromuscular orthopedist, that's okay. Just uh, be willing to recognize and refer it. And that's it. Thank you. First is... Oh, Rob. Yeah. First, this was a quick one. Great talk. Thanks. Uh, how often do you have to refill those pumps? I see the book is special, but I don't see the name. <laughs> um, I have some patients who get refilled every six months because that's when the med expires. And my most frequent patient who's on the highest dose gets refilled every three weeks. And now we have a home company that refills him because we're not dragging him in the office every three weeks. But um it's variable. I, the average is probably about four or five months. Is there a difference in the effect on the muscle histologically uh, between the pump and the injections? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think Botox definitely alters the muscle, but because the baclofen never reaches the actual muscle, it's only working in the CSF, the muscle stays intact. I would love to do that. How do I get my patients to you? <laughs> we should. I, there are lots of times where I say, man, if we could just do FES for this, this would be fantastic. And then I say, okay, here's the number. And they all get kind of lost in the intake process, but I'd love to see that happen. Thank you.